Well, let's get started. Um, today is going to be the last week for, or the last session for a lot of us here. <laughs> we did Coastal Nav 1 and this last day of Coastal Nav 2. Um, for me, I teach the, um, the, what am I calling it? The weekend workshops. But I'll be doing that in August and Celestial, if you want to take another class with me. But there are lots of other classes at, um, at OCC to take. I know they are, a lot of them are filled at the moment because they have limited capacity now and people are really interested. So, um, but I hope you enjoyed your, your classes with me. And even though we had to do uh, Zoom learning, I think I think it worked out okay. What is the next class in the progression kind of for you if, if we were to just kind of continue on this path? I would recommend? say more of those in-person ones. So the um, electronic navigation and then um, is it like bear boat or something like that where you take, it's like you take the um, Betty, the sailboat Betty. over to Catalina yeah. and you do the navigation. Are they running those now? Are those running? I thought those were still on hold. I'm not positive. You can sign up for them, but they haven't decided whether they're going to yeah, go or not because they're overnight. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just finagled my way onto a Catalina 42, so I'm just hands-on, just digging through the guy's brain on the nav system, like asking him all these questions. What does this do? What does this do? How do I do this? So, so. <laughs> yeah, so I would definitely say the next step for nav stuff is to, you know, put what you're learning here into practice and either take out your, you know, a boat of you or your friends or uh, take one of the classes that OCC has, but I'm not positive on the status of those. Um, Does uh, radar observation do have anything to do with this? So I would say yes, yes and no. So radar observation is uh, mainly um, collision avoidance and a little bit of plotting your position, but you should already know basically how to plot your position, and then uh, you practice it in the in the radar um, simulator. Um, so I do. I'm going to do a weekend workshop. So it's just one day, uh, one day class. That's just kind of a overview intro of like what are all these blips and blobs on the screen, and what do they mean, and how can I like tune it to make it look better? What am I looking at, kind of thing. Um, but then there, I do teach a seven week class, like once, once a week, I think it's actually three and a half for four hours. Um, but that's not until the fall. That is actually through the school OCC. So I, I'm pretty sure you have to sign up as a student where these classes are just like community classes. Yeah, next Tuesday I start that class. Um, okay, it's like cool. Every Tuesday from six to ten, ten fifteen. Okay. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So you will definitely be using um, those radar transfer plotting sheets that we did. Um, yeah, and mostly about collision avoidance and kind of visualizing you know, what blips and blobs you're seeing on the screen. But that kind of vector triangle, you're going to do a new triangle that's all about um, relative motion, essentially. Relative motion, true motion, that kind of thing, which is a really cool class. Definitely recommend it if you're going to be seeing a radar on board. I feel like a lot of people, if they have radar, never really turn it on, but it's a great tool for both navigating and collision avoidance. So if you are familiar with it, it helps. <laughs> um, yeah, 
how did how did you guys do with the uh, voyage plan exercise? Just had it. Any comments or feedback on that? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, did anybody use a different format than the than the one in the worksheet, or have one from online or anything? Okay. All right. Cool. I'm glad. I'm glad it makes sense for you guys. So yeah, a voyage plan is always good. You could you know save those voyage plans if you're going you know to Newport Avalon back. You know save your waypoints. You could save them on paper in your logbook, save them in your GPS, save them on your electronic plotter, keep them on your chart, all sorts of things. So it makes it a little bit easier to do the next voyage plan or easier to edit. Um, I really like that. Um, what else? Well, today uh, we're gonna go over GPS. Um, so kind of our electronic navigation, our main electronic navigation is going to be uh, GPS these days. Um, like Robert was mentioning, there is radar, but there's a different class for that. And we don't use Loran anymore. Um, so our real electronic navigation is going to be our GPS system. Um, so that's what we're going to go over today. Um, Three. any questions? Yeah. Just about the, the final. Um, yep. The tide calculation one, it was asking for April 21st, 2019 on the test. Oh. And like all the answers were the same for 2019. So. Um, for 2021 and 2019? No, I, I think the answers show 2019 they answers. They were 2019. Yeah. It's just we don't have the tide tables for. 2019. For 2019. So I watched the video and just followed along with it on that. Okay. So I didn't change that one. Change 2019. Did anybody try any of the um, Coast Guard questions or current questions? No. Okay. Just a little extras. Cool. All right. Um, then let's get started. Here we go. Oh, I have to share, share. All right, you guys can see the PowerPoint? Yeah, cool. Okay, so we're gonna talk about GPS. Does anybody know what GPS stands for? Global, Global position, position system. system. Yes, it is a global positioning system. Um, it is basically a constellation of satellites that are orbiting around the world. Um, we have 24 satellites. I think I'm going to go to the next one here. Yeah, we have 24 satellites. Um, 21 of them are our primary, and then we have three spares. But we have six um, orbiting planes, and each satellite passes um, twice a day. So has anyone seen a satellite at night if you're you know, out camping or somewhere yeah. where it's clear, and you're like, yeah. that star's moving at a very constant rate, you know? Uh, so you could definitely see these satellites. They are uh, visible. They're not like way out there. Um, so there are, yeah, 24 satellites. 
they operate on a very high radio frequency. So the point of that is to try to mitigate um, interferences, whether it's interference with, um, you know, ele other electronic navigation equipment you have on board. And there are always the um, interference from other, well, how am I going to say this? Um, bad intentioned people, I guess I'll say that. Um, there are lots of articles and theories online um, where we're not going to get dive into it all tonight um, about, you know, how people can um, interfere with your GPS system or take control of your GPS system, give you wrong information, take control of your ship, all sorts of other um, kind of that hacking day and age uh, conspiracy theories. I don't know. Anyways, um, GPS is operated by the United States government, but we do have, um, or we, out there in the orbiting satellites, there are three other systems. So GPS is the United States system. Uh, Galileo is operated and uh, maintained from the European Union. GLONASS is operated and maintained with Russia. And the, uh, how do you say this, Budu, Budu, is operated and ran by China. So our primary and the only one I've ever used is uh, GPS, but there are other systems out there. You would need, if you wanted to use another system, you would also need that system's, um, you know, satellite antenna, on board your vessel and receiver and, you know, interface. Um, but just so you know, there's a lot of other satellites out there. Um, each one has a different amount, I guess I would say. The um, Galileo European one has about 30. They have 27 they use. Um, the Chinese one has over 35, and GLONASS, the Russian one, has about 21. So, a lot of different, different satellites out there. So, how does the sat how do we get the position, or what's the, the theory behind, um, getting positions from a GPS and why is it so accurate? Um, so basically each satellite, I'm going to do the picture one here, each satellite is transmitting both um, their position and the position of all the other vessels or all the other um, satellites to your receiver. And that receiver is timing, so they use the speed of um, speed of light, I guess, speed of sound. I don't know what they use. They use the timing of when a signal is sent from the vessel or from the satellite to the vessel, and they can see how far away that satellite is from the receiver on board. And they can also do that triangulating, basically getting more aids to navigation, if you will. Like if I had a distance from me to the end of the jetty, and then me to the sea buoy, and then me to, I don't know, a point on land, that would be a triangulation of three distances. And I could figure out where I am. So it's the same kind of thing with the satellites. You're triangulating the best um, satellites to use because it's mapping out where all the other satellites are at the same time because they're all in motion. And then it's adjusting that motion with the time that it takes to receive that signal. So if the satellite sends this signal out and it takes, I don't know, 2.5 seconds for your ship to receive it, then it can know that it knows how far away 
you are from that satellite and that satellite and that satellite. So you end up getting these, um, I like this image better. You end up getting these spheres of possible, um, possible position. So on the chart, when we said that we were two miles away from Eva oil rig, we drew a circle around Eva oil rig that said, my line of position here is two miles away. I could be anywhere on this line that's two miles away from this position. Get another distance and then also add in that factor of, you know, look out the window. Am I east or west of these oil rigs or what's my sounding, that kind of thing. So that's the same kind of concept with these line of position spheres. So the line of position that we're getting from each satellite is a sphere. And if you get three overlapping, you get two possible locations and only one of those locations can be on the surface of the earth. Sur surface of the earth. So that's putting that extra piece of information in of, hey, you're on the surface of the earth. If you are in an airplane, then you also have to have an altitude meter of sorts to figure out how far above the surface of the earth you are. Is anybody here a pilot airplane? Sometimes we have airplane pilots. I always like to hear their take. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of reading on this slideshow, but you can, um, you can look at the slideshow. But does that kind of make sense on how we're getting a line of position from each satellite? That position is a sphere. And each satellite is transmitting, what does it say? Um, measuring the distance of more satellites. The position of that satellite and the position of all the other satellites. So you want to get the best geometry, just like we were doing with our, you know, aids to navigation with our coastal nav. The satellites want to do the same thing. So that's a very common error that it, if, if it keeps getting um, its position from, you know, satellite A and satellite A all of a sudden becomes poor geometry with another satellite and it hasn't switched over yet, you might get that um, error, uh, which is delusion of position, meaning that you have a bad geometry that it hasn't switched over to see another satellite yet. Um, most GPSs will do this automatically, but um, it's always good to know when you get that error that you don't just like, oh, silence error, silence error, I don't know what it's talking about. Um, that when you get that error, you can be like, oh, it needs to get another satellite. And I think I have picture, a lot of GPS units will show you where, which, you know, it doesn't mean anything to me of like where these satellites actually are, because I'm like, I don't know where they are in the globe or in the sphere, right? Um, but it'll kind of give you this, a lot of them are color-coded or they'll give you um, kind of that bar that says like this is giving you healthy information or unhealthy information. Um, these are your good satellites that we're getting geometry off of right now or wherever you are at this moment where those satellites are, you're not getting very good geometry specifically to where you are. So maybe in like, you know, a half hour or something when the satellites move a little bit more or you move a little bit more, you might get better um, signal or better geometry from that. Does the uh, county system that has 50% more satellites flying at two different altitudes make it a more accurate system? I mean, from that, from that information, I would say yes, but I do not know the accuracy of uh, the other 
country's systems. Um, probably something you could look at. I've only ever used uh, GPS, so I don't know what the accuracy of the other systems are. But that would make sense theoretically. I'm just not 100% sure. Okay. Um, generally speaking, GPS, again, this is uh, US, the American uh, GPS, is approximately 15 to 50 meters accurate, which is surprisingly not that accurate, in my opinion. But if you were navigating 15 meters, give or take, um, if you're in close congested waters, hopefully you're going slow and you can see, but I will show you next slide. We're going to talk about DGPS, which uh, gets much better accuracy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you can lose more accuracy if, again, your satellites that are in range have um, poor behavior. Maybe they're not orbiting as um, predictable as they should. Um, they kind of have this rating of healthy, unhealthy, um, red, yellow, orange, um, green, etc or it has a malfunction of sorts, the less satellites that you have that you are getting your distances from, the less accurate your position would be. You know, if you had an LOP from six different, um, you know, aids to navigation around you, I would say your position is very accurate. But if you only had two or three, then it would be less accurate. Um, or you get, cause you can get that triangle or, or whatever. Um, poor satellite geometry. We talked about that. Um, your antenna position. Again, you want to put your antenna, um, not inside the cabin. A lot of, uh, recreational boaters will have their, a handheld GPS. So you, when you're using that GPS to get a signal, you want to go up top and try to get the best signal possible, not down below next to all your other electronics. Um, if you have a mounted antenna, that is also, um, if it's mounted on the mast, that is great. Um, sometimes you can have a blocked signal if you are, you know, um, blocked by either land, mountains, or buildings. If you are close to a harbor or you are in a harbor and there are lots of buildings around you, you won't get that reach of the horizon. Um, and then the last one, if you are more than 300 miles from your last position or your manual inputted position is more than 300 miles off. So, um, this goes when you are, you know, maybe you have a handheld unit and you flew from the West Coast to the East Coast and you got on, you're going to want to put in like, hey, I think I'm in Florida. Put in your general position for Florida and then it will fine tune it. But if you say, hey, I think I'm in China, and it's like, I think you're in Florida, it's going to give you all sorts of weird information. Um, another common mistake when you're putting in manual information is that the default for most GPS is having a northerly um, latitude and an easterly longitude, where we typically, if you're navigating the United States, you're going to be in the westerly uh, Longitude. So you always want to figure out how to change your longitude if you're manually inputting on like a handheld, how to change that um, longitude to west. Default is usually east. Um,
Okay, these are some warning messages. We have um, our al almanac needs to be verified. That's missing information on other satellites. So that almanac is all of the data and position of where the other satellites are. So it can use the best satellites to get the best geometry to triangulate your position. Um, the 2D and 3D, this one always <laughs> makes me mad. The 2D is using three satellite fixes, three satellites to get a fix, and the 3D is getting four satellites to use a fix. Again, the more satellites you have, the more accurate your position is going to be. Um, if you are out of reach of all the, or yeah, if you have three satellites and one starts setting over the horizon or it's blocked by a building or whatever reason you lose signal to it, um, you can get an, a warning message that says it's using old data that it is using DR to keep yeah, dead reckoning. So it's saying, hey, you were going at this speed, such and such, this direction, I think you're gonna be in this area. So, um, so if you get old data, then it's basically using a DR to keep your position. And it will also do that, <coughs> excuse me, um, to keep the accuracy of your position. So sometimes if you all of a sudden stop or slow down, it might give you an old data position that says, oh, I think you should have been over here, but it's reading that you're still back here. It needs a little bit, depending on like the settings in your GPS. Um, when I was on, the oil rig and we would be um, rolling. We had our satellite antenna at the top of the rig, very, very high. And as we would roll, it would think we were moving, but we never actually moved. So it would give us this error all the time. Um, anyways, um, signal quality, geometry quality, that bad geometry is your uh, delusion of position warning. Um, has anybody gotten any of these warnings on a GPS that they've used? Okay. okay I did that one. Um, some GPS, some systems are, um, I don't know, try to get more accuracy than others. Um, so I, I put this this slide in here, um, kind of talking about that oil rig thing again. Sometimes your units can also have sensors um, attached or um, what is it? Integrated to other sensors on board that attach how much you are rolling, pitching, yawing, um, all those, uh, the six, um, there's six movements of a vessel. Um, so your six movements of a vessel. You have your surge, that's back and forth, parallel, right? Then you have your sway, that's side to side or kind of crabbing. Then you have your um, heave, that's up and down. And then you have your pivoting ones. You have your... Um, yaw, which is kind of like your steering, if you will. And then you have, um, if you put it, put something like right here, and you go up and down, that's your pitch. And then you have your roll. So you have your six movements that can be inter integrated into your GPS to make it even more accurate and more predictable of uh, where you are. Um, okay, so that was kind of GPS. Now we're going to talk about DGPS, which is what most um, satellites will be using now. It's actually called differential GPS, and it uses known positions. So it uses um, land-based stations 
a known position that says, I know I'm right here. So if the satellite is reading, you know, um, that I'm, I don't know, two miles away, but I know exactly where I am because I'm a fixed position, that it's 2.1 miles away, it will send a correction to that satellite and say that this satellite is, you know, delayed 0.5 seconds or whatever correction it is so that it will get um, more accurate information because it is basing its corrections from a known position, from a land-based position. Um, so our accuracy goes way down to, way down meaning much better, sorry, meaning um, 15 meters to 10 centimeters. And I have a little map here of where the United States DGPS stations are. So you can get, or these DGPS stations around here are going to give us much more accurate information of um, where we are because it has a known position and it's sending that correction to the satellites so that the correction to us on the boat is much more accurate. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Okay. Let's look at some units. So there's typical handheld units, and then we have the mounted units that have interfaces. Um, does anybody have a handheld unit that they've used? Or a mounted unit? Okay. You mean other than our cell phones? <laughs> Other than the cell phones. There is an article, I think I've put it on the Google Classroom that talks about um, marine GPS units versus cell phones or like other GPS units. Um, I hear most people, a lot of people use their cell phones. So they work to some degree. Um, I have a, sorry. I have a GPS uh, in mind, but I can't find the antenna. So would it be reading? Will the unit itself have like an internal antenna or? or... It may have had one, it but could. the previous owners. Um, because that's, yeah, that's the way that the handheld ones work. They have the antenna inside the unit. Um, I would honestly look up the make and model number hopefully you have like a model number on the back and that's with any in equipment on board is to download that user manual and be familiar with the user manual so hopefully something will tell you where the antenna is or the um where it's getting that input i'm not sure Okay, so on our units, we have all of these little, um, you know, acronyms and things and numbers. And we're like, what does all this mean? How can we use it to navigate? So let's go through some of those. Um, WP or WPT is waypoint. And that's going to be, you know, it's not an actual thing. That's, you know, a place that we've created, a turning point or a fictional thing that we've created. It could be on land. It could be in the middle of the ocean. It could be on a buoy. It could be, you can make a waypoint anywhere. Um, you know, put a waypoint on that fishing spot that you got lucky on last summer or something. Um, you can put a waypoint anywhere. Um, and then you could connect those waypoints in a certain order to create a route. So that's what we did in our voyage plan. We had waypoints one through six, one through five, and we put them together and we created a route. 
So you can save these routes or these waypoints, and you could also delete them or edit them um, in your GPS units. So it makes it easier to go to that route or go to such and such waypoint. I always like to name the waypoint in your unit instead of waypoint, it'll automatically do like waypoint 001 or 002, whatever. So if you name the waypoint as, you know, NWP buoy or, um, you know, EVA platform or whatever it was like the 12 mile fishing spot or something. If you give it just a brief description or lettered abbreviation um, just to help so it's not just all of these numbers that you're like, I'm looking for waypoint 89 and you have to like scroll down to try to find waypoint 89 or something like that. Um, can be very tedious. So I recommend naming your waypoints and naming your routes if you're saving them. Um, distance, that's typically the distance to the waypoint. So if we go back to a GPS unit, um, this one actually says distance to next. Um, I don't think this one says anything on it. But typically, if it just says distance, it's giving you the distance to that waypoint, that destination that it is locked on, essentially. Distance to go is your distance to the final waypoint. If you are engaged or um, engaged, it, that's what on the GPSs that I use, it was like engage this route, um, but I'm sure there's other sorts of terms on GPSs that you, you know, activate that route or something. Um, in that route, your distance to go is to the final waypoint. And sometimes that final waypoint is not your destination. So keep that in mind. Maybe your distance to go will get you to the NWP buoy, but you still have another 15, 20 minutes of transiting to get to the dock or something like that. So keep that in mind. The bearing, the BRG, that's going to be our bearing to the waypoint. So if the waypoint is our, you know, destination on our route, we want the bearing and the course over ground to be the same, right? That means that it is, that we're on the closest possible approach, or not the closest possible approach, the, um, yeah, the closest possible way to get there. Um, I'm gonna put this on the, on this guy. Okay, so here is waypoint A, and I have waypoint B. It's not a straight line. But this is my route. If I am, so let's call this what are we calling this? Two, two, five, we'll call it. That's our degrees for our route. If I am over here, my bearing to the waypoint is going to be Four. something less, right? Maybe two, two, zero. If my course over ground, and usually your GPSs will give you that vector as well, a course over ground vector, that says if I continue in the direction that I'm going, then I will end up, I don't know, 
over here in six minutes. You could kind of set that vector to however you want. So you want that vector and your bearing vector. So your course over ground and your bearing, even if it means you're crabbing kind of like that, you want those to be the same because that's going to get you Lord. directly to your waypoint. So you want your bearing and your course over ground to be the same. So this is your, your cheat sheet here where, let's say, our bearing is two to five, and we, we see we're getting pushed, and it says our course over ground, so our bearing is two to five, our course over ground is two to seven, our heading is... Yeah. Tie it in already. Two to zero. Oops. What would we want to do? If we're in like autopilot. We yeah, want two one eight. These to be the same, right? So we want we can see our course over ground. We want to make it two clicks or two, you know, degrees to the, to the left. So that would be less than. So we would want to go to 218 to try to get these two numbers to be the same. If we were more concerned on getting to our track line, then maybe we go, let's just go 215 to try to get the bearing line or the course over ground line kind of closer to the track line from your bearing line. So sometimes your GPS will just be giving you values, just be giving you values like this. And sometimes it'll have, you know, the picture with the actual vectors, which is a little easier to conceptualize, right? Um, but we just want to keep in mind that what these meaning, if you're just looking at that, um, that screen with all the numbers on it, it's still great information. Oops. If you're, um, if, if the current keeps pushing you south, let's say in that picture, then isn't the bearing gonna, and course over ground eventually gonna approach each other? Yes. The bearing and the course over ground, you want to approach each other and get to the same. Okay. That's, that would be the, the goal. So I just like to look at those numbers. Um, you also have your speed over ground. We have XTE, that's your cross track error. So that's how far away you are from the route line that you've created. So sometimes it's okay, you're like, oh, I'm, you know, a half mile off the track line, that's okay. I'm, I'm headed towards my, my waypoint, my bearing and my course over ground are the same. I'm okay with that. Or, oh, I want my course over, my cross track error to be zero, then I'll head closer to that um, track line. Again, that track line is just that fictional route that you've created, right? It's not a road that everybody else is transited on unless it's through a traffic lane or whatever. Um, 
a lot of times you'll get a time to the waypoint. So that's your, um, you know, your quick ETA that it's giving you an ETA to the waypoint. A lot of GPSs, if you bring up the voyage plan or the route, they'll give you the ETA to each waypoint, but they are using your actual um, speed over ground at that moment instead of the one that you've plugged in as a um, estimated speed. Or you can adjust the settings one way or the other, but it's just good to know how it's getting that ETA. If it's using your estimated speed or your actual speed over ground. So again, that is going to be, look at the owner's manual, um, the user manual. Now, the, I think it's typically called the user manual. It, usually it has very quick reference guides at the beginning. And then there's like all that detailed information that is good to know. But definitely be familiar with those quick references at the beginning of a user manual. And then you have your MOB position. So that button, usually it's it's like a big scary button. It's covered in red plastic. It's covered in like a plexiglass thing and it's red and, um, and it says man overboard. That man overboard button on your GPS does not send a signal to anybody. It's literally just saves that position. So you wanna push it when you have a man overboard so you know where that man overboard is or push it when your sunglasses fell over or you know whatever. If you wanna save a position, you could push that man overboard button and it will automatically save that position. What also might happen is it will disengage or deactivate the route that you've been following and then start to give you um, bearing and distance back to that um, man overboard position. Um, but again, it does not send a signal to the Coast Guard. It's not sounding the alarms. It's just saving a position. Okay. Um, Ectus or electronic plotters. A lot of times these can be integrated into other systems you have on board. So your GPS, your depth sounder, your radar, um, all sorts of other things can be integrated into one uh, system, which is great. And um, if you overlay the systems, it's incredibly helpful to check those for accuracy. So you can see if you're radar and your GPS says, oh, the land is this way, but the GPS says the land should be this way, that you can see something is off and it needs to be adjusted. Um, so they're super quick for checking the accuracy if you have those overlays. Um, and I have a little note here to always be careful if you have if your radar is giving you bad info or your depth sounder is giving you bad info and it's all integrated, then everything else is going to be giving you bad info too. So you just want to be cautious of that. Um, and human error. It's so easy to punch in the wrong numbers, to put in, mix up a number here and there. It's it takes practice to uh, to punch in all of your numbers and and things and GPS or waypoints and routes and things. So um, always double check. Have somebody else double check it. Be like, oh, does this make sense? Um, yeah, human error is a big one. Okay, um, here are some pictures of different uh, GPS. Uh, systems. We have Route 2, Route 3. Again, I'd like to name the route, you know, Newport to Avalon or Newport to San Diego, whatever, San Diego, Channel Islands. I always like to name the routes. And then you have all your waypoints. Again, name your waypoints. It's a lot easier to figure out where these are if they're named. Um, 
but that's, you know, you can check your written out voyage plan. A lot of times you can just create your voyage plan. And I think someone was saying some, t some routes uh, share other people's voyage plans, and then you could just print this out. I guess probably you don't have a printer on board, but, or screenshot it maybe. And then you could easily trans, um, you know, translate it and mark it on the chart. Um, so that's always great. You don't have to go back and forth looking at the screen. Um, so normally you enter in the waypoints prior to your voyage or are you entering waypoints as you're going? I would enter the waypoints prior to your voyage. Have a voyage plan so you know, you know, this is my plan of attack. Again, you can always adjust and edit as long as, as along the way. Um, but definitely, you know, I'm leaving Newport. I'm then headed to the, you know, traffic separation scheme, and then I'm headed up to the Channel Islands, and then I'm headed up to Ventura, or wherever you are. Have that plan before you go, so you don't have to be doing all of your um, plotting and planning and looking through your books or looking at the chart um, while underway. So you want to have that voyage plan done ahead of time. And a lot of times you can use your electronic plotters to quickly, easily create that voyage plan. I like to, maybe it's my OCD-ness, but I put in kind of like, oh, I want to go here, 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 and here. And then I'll adjust my uh, Latin longs so they end in like a 0.5 or a 0.2 or something. So it's easier to plot than if you just click a button or just click somewhere on the screen you can have, you know, your waypoint of 33 degrees, 29.246789910, whatever, obviously not 10, but, you know, this big long waypoint. So I kind of like clean it up. I'll draw in my, use the electronic plotter to draw in my route, clean it up, label everything, make sure it makes sense, and then I'll print it out, screenshot it, whatever, and then plot it on the chart make sure it makes sense on the chart. And then that's my um, kind of pre-voyage preparation for navigation. And it, of course, you know, oh, we're skipping this one or we're changing this route. Um, you can also save in, you know, uh, kind of like those emergency routes. You know, if I'm headed up to San Francisco, well, I already have a route, you know, into, Ventura Harbor or something, if I need to go get supplies or somebody got hurt or something, I can just click, oh, Ventura, you know, route Ventura, and it'll send me directly there. So it's good just to have, you know, your routes saved. That way you can click on them easily and go to them. Um, yeah, you always want to pre-plan. Okay. Um, we have some units can have uh, different information screens. So it's definitely, you know, up to personal preference of what kind of screen you want to be looking at. You have the one panel where it's just your chart. You have another one where it's half the chart, half the radar. Another one, one third chart, and then a quarter radar, a quarter um, information, just that those data points. Um, if you want, you know, none of these ones said your exact position. If you want to, you know, have a quick reference point to log your position, you can get that screen going or different gauges. Again, these gauges would mean that your engine systems are integrated into your um, electronic system and you have digital readouts on your gauges. I don't know if that. I'm going to say that's probably not very common, but maybe it is. I, I'm not sure in recreational boating. I don't know. Um, 
so when you have your data data boxes, I call it data boxes because you just have all of these numbers. A lot of people are like, I don't know what all these numbers is. But now we know after taking this class, we have you know our speed over ground, our course over ground, our cross track error. Um, sometimes you get your cross track error with a uh, visual. I think this one's a little bit better. It kind of gives you this, you are a little bit to the right of track. You want it, and it gives you an arrow. You want to steer. You're to the left of track. You want to steer to the right. Um, so it gives you that kind of little symbol down there. Gives you your position, your time, day, you know, speed over ground, course over ground. Um, what do we have? Distance to TDD would be distance to your destination. TDW would be distance to the waypoint. So again, that's your final position in the waypoint or your, the final position in the route or to your waypoint. Um, a lot of times it, oh, none of these here give you your ETA, but a lot of times they will. Here we got an estimated time of arrival. Um, sometimes they'll give you uh, your heading with like a you know, digital compass instead of just a number. Again, you know, personal preference on how you like to see your compass displayed. Um, time to go. Makes sense. You got your bearing, your coaster over ground. You want those to be the same. Your range, your speed over ground, your cross track error. Let's see. Um, I just, has anyone seen you? I mean, I know some of you have used some electronic plotters. Do any of you use those data screens and those, this type of information? Or are you more of the visual look at the electronic chart? What are your guys' preferences? My GPS is split. So with I data or split with way? Split with the course line and so chart and then the data. And then data. Right. Cool. All right. Um, I got one more, two more slides here. Um, something we didn't talk about was, or I think we talked about it in Coastal Nav 1, um, but our navigation at night, um, you know, we can heavily rely on our electronic navigation equipment with navigation at night because we can't see as well. Excuse me. Um, so we always want to make sure um, if we are double checking our electronic navigation system by visual, that we correctly identify those aids to navigation. Lights can be very deceiving because of the brightness, you think it's real close, or the dim, you think it's pretty far, but at night it can be very um, deceiving or disorienting. So you always want to really know which light you're looking for if you're using it as I'm approaching the safe watermark. You want to make sure you correctly identify the safe watermark that you're headed for. Um, collision avoidance. We always want to follow uh, the rules of the road when it comes to lights. My next slide talks about uh, which lights we are seeing for on vessels. Um, you always want to turn, have a good lookout by turning down lights on board. So you want to be able to see other boats approaching you for collision avoidance or for navigation. Um, and if you have a bunch of lights on board, it makes it much harder to see lights on the horizon or lights around you. Um, a lot of vessels have the red lights um, for navigating at night. 
to maintain your night vision. Um, does anybody have red lights on? Has anyone seen that on board? Okay. Um, so that's, you know, really maintain your, maintain your night vision. You could switch out with your red light bulbs. Um, I wouldn't say all commercial vessels do that. I mean, it's suggested, but a lot of, you know, if you're having a party on board, a lot of people just have their lights on. Um, and at night to slow down, it, it definitely is, gives you that disorientation of, uh, you know, where you are and where other vessels are around you. So to just slow down and give yourself a little bit more time to make sure you know where you are, make sure you know where other vessels are and where they're going, um, you know, the slower you're going, the more time you give yourself to assess the situation. So um, always good to go a little bit slower at night. Um, monitor your tools for situational awareness. Again, you always want to use everything available to you to maintain your situational awareness, to maintain, you know, uh, where you are. So use use what you have. You know, sometimes you only only have one thing, or um, or you don't really have anything at all. That happens too. But use what you have, um, and don't just keep it off. I guess I would say. Uh, for celestial, you if you're navigating. Um, you know, across an ocean and you don't have any of these background lights, right? Um, you can use your celestial for position plotting at sunrise and sunset. Um, that's when you get your positions. Um, for our lights, so hopefully, hopefully we all know here, um, our green light is on our right side or our starboard side. Our red light is on the left side or the port side. And it is specifically um, angle or gives you this um, visual arc, if you will. The red light goes from dead ahead to, um, what is it, 22.5 degrees abaft the beam. And that is the, um, I think we talked about this in our rules lecture, that is the um, window of crossing. If you are seeing only a stern light, then you are overtaking. So if you're seeing only the green light, you're crossing. If you're seeing both lights, then you are, um, then they are approaching you directly. Like this case, we have a boat where we see both lights, we are seeing them uh, head on. So always good to know your, your lights and when you are, I think I said this last time too, when you are, you know, making a maneuver to avoid someone, you want to make it a significant change where your aspect changes. It's easier to see an aspect of a vessel change during the daylight, but at night when you're only seeing this red or green light, you really want to have a bigger course change one way or the other to give you that change of aspect to say, you know, yes, I'm going to give way, or I'm maintaining course and speed, whatever it is. Um, really important up in Long Beach in the harbor area to know the lights when a barge is being towed so you don't run through the tow line. Yes, yes. Do you know what those are? Three vertical white lights on the mast. Three lights, yep. Three white. So, <clears throat> yeah. Does anybody have any other questions? It was kind of a, oops. Kind of a quick lecture tonight, but we went through a lot, I feel like. No questions or anything? So Bree, does does your cell phone basically use DGPS then? Is that why it's so much more accurate? Or is it using some other? You know, I don't know what your cell phone is using. 
That's a good question. Doesn't the cell phones use the cell towers to triangulate? I would, I would think they use the cell towers and not an actual GPS, not the GPS satellites. Um, right. So I would say you'd lose range, but some people say that they have GPS on their phone. I don't I know if that's actual clear. GPS or not. I, I don't use my phone out at sea. To add a GPS to the phone is adding a second technology instead of just using the same technology you're using on a phone, which is triangulation of the towers. I think, people, uh, I think GPS is like Kleenex. So they said it's GPS, but it's not really GPS. Okay. But sometimes you don't have a signal, but yet you're still receiving GPS on your cell phone. So I'm, I'm thinking it might be GPS. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Either. We heard a Mayday call on Sunday from a uh, challenger somewhere between the two piers, I think. And, but they gave the um, Harbor Patrol GPS coordinates. I'm pretty sure he had the GPS coordinates from his phone. However, they said, these are wrong, sir. Those are not correct. Those are on land. Those are not correct. So they were out there uh, looking for this guy that ran out of gas in his boat right in there. And his GPS was giving them a position on land. Yeah, but he was probably about a half mile out in the ocean. So they they were running around for twenty minutes trying to find him. <laughs> okay, I looked sure it up. It find, your phone finds it by the location of GPS towers. I mean, of cellular towers. That's cellular the towers. The location. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I'm I'm thinking of the old. You know what I had? I used to have in my car like the GPS units before phones had the GPS map. Like, I would assume those had GPS? I don't those, know. those were satellite. Those the were Garmin, satellite, yeah. Those were satellite. Because remember, um, you would always say, trying to locate satellites? Yeah. Hide the garage? Yeah. Or if you didn't use it for a long time, it's say trying to locate satellites? Yeah. So that those would use actual GPS. Before. It also makes sense because Garmin is also in the marine navigation um, business. Yes. You wouldn't have two different technologies. Yeah, it was like the little Tom Tom that we had. <laughs> Anyways, I don't know. That's all I got for you guys today. I hope hope you guys learned something over the last uh, thirteen weeks. <laughs> um, but yeah. Hopefully I'll see you guys around the sailing center when uh, when we get back to it. I'll I'll be there teaching in person at some point. Thank you, Bree. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bree. Thank, thank, thank you guys. You Have a good one. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah.